and welcome to a very special episode of Life in the Mind. I am your host for this episode, Joy Amy Wigman, and I am your host for this episode because today I am interviewing my co-presenter, Murray Spear. Hello. <laughs> this is a neurodivergent podcast presented by neurodivergent people, and we thought it would be a nice idea for you to get to know your hosts a little bit better, as we've been talking to other people this whole time. I probably could do with getting to know Murray a little bit better. Oh dear. I know. <laughs> so Murray, big questions. Mm -hmm. What is your relationship with neurodivergence? Um, complex, difficult. No, no <laughs> um, <cool>. very, <laughs> many and varied. Um, I am autistic. Mm -hmm. I have ADHD and I'm dyspraxic. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's good. It's that 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 a good it? list. That is it. yeah. <laughs> it's a good yeah. list. We stack. So many people don't realise that we stack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when did you first sort of discover that you might be neurodivergent? Was it a young thing, or did you find out when you were older? So I came to it late. Um, well, apart from the dyspraxia, mm -hmm. <laughs> the dyspraxia was just kind of a taken baseline from very young. I just well. Murray, why why are your elbows over there? So you, you don't <laughs> need to be carrying that um, mug with your elbow by your ear. Well, somehow that's happening. And watching me ladle soup out of a, a bowl, it's just like I'm kind of at this weird angle where some someone's in, it's like elbow is above the ladle, mm -hmm. and I'm just going whoop, and yeah. But that's the way my brain works, and that's how it does does that. Anyway, it can. That um, tells me you'd be an amazing contemporary dancer. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think yeah. If I, Why must if we I ladle soup in such a boring way? <laughs> yeah. Also, like trying to go over a style. Some days I walk, I like walk up to it and just go one foot on the step, one foot on the top of the entire fence thing perfect balance and then just jump off the other side other days i walk up to it and I, my brain freezes and i suddenly turn into the spider with like a thousand limbs kind of going how do i just <laughs> it's, yeah my knees up by my ear and i'm going Aah. so you sort of discovered that first how about do you mind if i ask you kind of how old you were when you sort of realized that you might be moving in a different way to maybe other members of your family I think my mum realised um, right. quite young, um, because I think my granddad, we kind of always posited that my granddad was probably dyspraxic, and then my mum or my uncle were, cause, and I just <laughs> took on those traits of, I just kind of was replicating those traits of, yeah, you write in an interesting way, you just sometimes do things, yeah, you move interestingly, hmm. but yeah. It wasn't until much later that I then found out about um, the other two aspects, feathers to the cap. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so was it a sort of, um, was there kind of a, a moment when you when you made this realisation or was it like a slow burn that, that kind of trickled for you? For, so I worked, I found out that I was autistic properly as in like I had the actual diagnosis mm -hmm. um when I was 25 back in 2017 showing your age there Murray <laughs> <laughs> um and it was I think that that was a really strange process of like complex process for me because I'd come to that after try and cut a long story, sh yeah, story short <laughs> type of thing um long period of being on various different mental health medications mm -hmm. that were kind of zombifying me quite a lot um so i was uh, only partly myself kind of interesting very little memory of that time now but i yeah long story short came off all of those um at one point or like it's, it, there was a point where I took myself, uh, yeah. which I would not recommend. Don't do that. No, don't try that homelessness. Psychiatrists are 
there for a reason. Um, but yeah, it was after that that I had this slow burn process of kind of coming back to myself. Mm. Um, and I suddenly got the ability to read um, again. I read a book in a day for the first time since I was like 12. Um, which for me was used to be a very baseline thing. It's not anymore because ADHD brain means like, ooh, but there's words further down the page I want to read. Oh, but that's not the order with which they work. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, but there was this, I was over a period of a summer. I kind of worked out that I was coming back to myself. I got more of my brain back um, and I, went to university as well. I got myself into a place and keep on clearing and clearing by a, a personal statement thing because I was so far removed from the age and of my grades that they were useless by that point. Um, and then I went off to uni and my brain was just fizzing and going, Ooh! New things. and disappeared off to, and I was the capability, the the fullness of my sense of self and actual being um, had come back. And then it was whilst I was at uni um, that I started having, it was almost like the half-life of the medication wore off. Yeah. And I started just like sensory stuff started becoming a problem. So lights were becoming painful, noises were becoming painful, um, touch, um, and I was getting overloaded. Um, yeah. but had no idea what was happening because it was a, it was a familiar, but also new because there's had been this period of zombified <laughs> brain, um, semi Murray. So I, um, as so I was going to ask, kind mm. of how your discovery of being neurodivergent changed your relationship with yourself, but it sounds like you had this initial kind of feeling like yourself again after kind of the, the medication wearing off and stuff. But then after that, getting this, this fear of, of what was happening kind of around you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It felt like it was me. It was yeah. me coming back and more of the fullness of my being coming back into play. Um, but at the same time, it was, yeah, I was just overloaded a lot i lost the capacities for speech and comprehension of language quite a few times just entirely i was writing emails to tutors to go i'm not going to be able to come in and they would send an email back going sorry Mary, i don't know what that said and i would read it the next day and it would just be letters just jumbled up in a it made it, it was literally just gobbledygook which is fascinating <laughs> from a <laughs> psychological and neurological point of view but but then, yeah, from there, the fast forward a bit, I went, because um, we were going to be like, is this mental health stuff? What's, you know, obviously it was distressing as well. Um, so I went to mental health service where I was at uni down in Chichester. Um, and I think it was a few minutes after I walked into the room, um, this person said, have you ever been assessed for autism? Right. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> um, yeah, and then from there, I I had a weird relationship with kind of self-discovery and acceptance of it within myself until I had the diagnosis because I had this fear of needing an assessment right yeah kind of, and because of things that have happened in the past for me um do you know i hear that from a lot of people yeah. that, this kind of fear that oh well what if i'm leading it what if what if i'm what if i'm making it up yeah. what if this is not what this is and i'm making a fuss and i i hear that from so many people when we talk about it including myself um oh, yeah. completely get it so allowing yourself the validity of the space yeah and your um and that it, that it is something that you can, yeah, that can be you. Mm. Um, especially 
if you you've grown up in the world that we live in yeah so we don't, many misconceptions we don't have this valid space so why no, would we feel valid also, <laughs> all of the, the ideas there are so many myths out there about what it looks like it's like but i can't do maths i can <laughs> do maths but i can't show you how i've done it i can give you the answer but working out <laughs> no no idea how i got that yeah i i have that with with kind of oh so you know um uh, directions directions <sighs> to places um like oh you just turn left at the thing and then you do this and that like no literally if you if you start telling me that my brain will just shut off because <laughs> the visualization of it, i can't do that yeah. um but yeah, yeah did you? Strange. Yes. Because I um I haven't gone through the whole diagnosis process yet officially. Um, I'm sort of you know hovering on that list. <laughs> um, when you did, did you sort of um? I don't want to use the phrase "come out," but in effect, <laughs> um, did you like announce to people or? Did you just kind of let it be part of you? Because I don't think there's a wrong, right and a wrong way to do that. I think it's very individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the nuance of how yeah. each person. Um, for me, it was, it was definitely, I found it really complex to try and work out how to approach that and what, what way to do it, whether to... Um, shout and scream it to the world and or and also just how it sat with me and yeah fearing that validity the lack of validity in it and going oh but do i need the do i need the diagnosis do i need the um do i need people to know is it better for me to introduce myself as autistic or just be me um and all of those nuances and there's still things that i I think uh, every single day, um, some of those. Um, but I definitely, yeah, I went through that process and did. It was only once I had the official diagnosis for me that allowed me to accept it fully. Yeah. Because person who person who has authority to say gave me permission to say. Yeah. <laughs> and the rules were ticked so therefore <laughs> like literally was <laughs> some of the things where I was like ah oh, wow that's kind of ironic in itself <laughs> yeah I, I mean there there is this whole thing of of feeling like you're being given permission by somebody else to actually accept who you are which is is really tricky I think yeah. um can I ask because obviously you are a podcaster Mm -hmm. but also you do kind of performing and stuff in your life um how how is that sort of has it or has it informed the way that you perform or the methods that you use as a performer i would say it massively <laughs> massively has yeah <laughs> i um once i worked like worked out and had discovered the um my neurodivergence <laughs> i looked back and i went oh that's one of the reasons i become also an actor um one of the reasons i like acting and find it really quite easy to just shift between different modes and stuff and slip into character and out of character and um manifest the emotions and you know do various acting things also don't get stage fright because it's my everyday yeah. is masking yeah. and it always has been it, acting has just been my way of life forever um also acting's great because it's, it's a scripted <laughs> social interaction literally everything is scripted and if anybody goes off script they're wrong <laughs> so actually there are there are there are rules to it there are you, rules you and you have to stick to them you have to stick to them everybody's got the same rule book <laughs> we've been told what to do it's great <laughs> yeah and then someone comes along and says hey do you want to do some long form improv oh, like, uh, that's I my know. entire life <laughs> <laughs> actually i hate that long form improv mm. Mm. Well, i think because adhd brain is going but there are so many possibilities and autistic brains going i need closed down possibilities to be able to actually do anything 
And so ADHD brains can be all of these ideas and autism brain is going, Ugh! and so I just end up freezing or just kind of melting down. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because that, that's that's quite a combination, isn't it? ADHD and autism, because a lot of a lot of the symptoms does it feel like they battle each other sometimes? Yes. Right. Yeah, they um the way that I kind of perceive it these days is think about it is that there are times when they really are um in conflict with each other, opposite ends of the battle to so, yeah, avoid the S word. Um <laughs> <laughs> and so for example, yeah, my um the autistic part of my brain wanting routine and plans mm. and the framework. But ADHD brain really not liking to be suffocated by it, and feeling quite trapped by it. So I have I found like a middle ground of I have a framework of a plan. And then can kind of an options of what I can do. Ah, so you operate so, within the options. Yes, nice. exactly. So I've it. got that freedom and that spontaneity, but within. Um, so like going on holiday, I've got the things you need to be booked down. Those are booked in, um, and then the rest of the time I can kind of fill in with um, improvised <laughs> random stuff with just like a couple, um, another couple of planned stuff. Um, but then, yeah. There are times when they work perfectly in sync, and actually, um, it's like I'm operating at 110 percent capacity of human brainness because my brain's moving really, really quickly, but also being able to hold loads and loads of information. Yeah. And so I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. So sort of looking back now that you know what you know about your neurodivergence and stuff. Do you think that there might have been a, a reason why it wasn't caught earlier or? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, I think it was actually said in my assessment day thing because I, I ended up going private um, for my assessment. I was very lucky to be able to actually afford that with the help of <laughs> lots of family members. Um but I think they, they mentioned it there that I have a classically female presentation of autism, um, which is it's a fascinating thing in itself. Um, but I mean, I found a brilliant graphic um, when I was kind of going through that process about these traits in female autism mm -hmm. um, and I looked at it and it, it is really kind of a lot of it is, is the stuff that is me but of course I am male presenting um, right. and, and was socialized as male um, but a lot of the things in this graphic and I can I think we can share that if we want to. Well, not. I mean, it's not not what we recommend, so that might not make sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it kind of it sits it sits weirdly with me because I think it's such a tripping point to genderize diagnoses mm. like this. Part because a lot of it in my mind are socialized things yeah so for example to to <laughs> buy into the uh gender binary um because of his history using it in a historical concept um women have historically been uh it's more expected for them to be quiet seen <laughs> and not heard all of that <laughs> yes. nonsense um behave yourself yeah. um, you know act a certain way when there are boys around um yeah and yeah. for <laughs> um if you think of like men doing computer -y jobs and jobs with numbers or jobs that allow uh, required you to sit by yourself and press a lot of information or <laughs> Yeah. You know, various different things that were just diligent, hardworking type of thing. You know, oh, you're diligent and you're hardworking and you're, you're just you're very good at keeping the time, keep going, <laughs> um, type of thing.
thing. It's like, oh, and then you correlate that. I mean, obviously this is a, a Murray theory, um, but you correlate that with, oh, autism exists more in men. <laughs> Those two and things. You go, um, does it? Or is it just because you're expecting them to be quiet? Yeah. And not, you know, not be sociable in certain ways or the, the things that are expected in them. You can bring in with ADHD as well, very much so. And actually, dyscalculia, you know, dyslexia, and dyspraxia in the same way. So by just focusing on what are typically in bunny ears uh, male traits, like it feels like things are being lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By, by putting any genderizing on it, you're... I think you're losing you're, you're losing some of the social and actually it's dangerous it's really yeah. dangerous because actually it doesn't need to exist it's just treat each being as each being in these kind of in neurological ways because of course there are biological nuances and all of these things that we you know we're all individuals are, but we are in, all, yeah, individuals. We're all individuals yeah i think that's probably a, a good place to sort of wrap up on we are all individuals mm. because that's sort of what this podcast is about isn't it uh, validating everyone's individual voices rather than clumping us all into a big old group uh, well thank you for chatting with us murray i'm looking forward to having Happy you to back on this here. side of the table with me because <laughs> it's a lot more useful <laughs> for me to have a bit of help when i'm presenting Okay, folks, that's it for this episode. You can follow us on Instagram at life.inthemind. Our other socials are linked in our bio. Don't forget to like, subscribe and comment. See you next time.